Tarek Hege, welcome to Hard Talk. I'm delighted to be here. What is going on in Cairo? In the last few days, we've seen violent scenes, clashes in Tahrir Square, reminiscent of what was happening in February. What on earth is going on? Normally, a revolution will not be complete in two, three years. Mao Zedong once was asked by one of your great politicians about the French Revolution, and he said, it is too early to talk about it. So this was 200 years after the revolution. Of course, this is an exaggeration, but it is in the process. But it's far from being complete. Far from being complete, and now there is confusion about the attitude of the public toward the military, because in those recent demonstrations in Tahrir Square, we heard people calling for the resignation of the chief of the current military government, Field Marshal Tantawi. Have the public lost faith in the army? I think we can't talk about the public as one body in Egypt. Egypt, for the first time since 1952, not 81, since 1952, has this open theater that is open for anybody to come on the stage, Muslim brothers, liberals like myself, cops. Do you know that the cops usually demonstrate in Egypt inside the cathedral? It's the, the first Coptic Christians. Exactly, the Orthodox. Yep. They always demonstrated inside the cathedral. It's the first time in their history to go outside in the streets, which means they said, OK, we are Egyptian first and cops. So we have all colors on the stage. Well, I take that point. But you, for one, were writing just weeks ago that you were feeling very positive. About, Extremely positive. The, about the role of the military in particular, the way they'd handled the, the toppling of Mubarak and the transition. Are you feeling so positive about the military now? Absolutely. I have no problem. I tell you why. I look at what was going on in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Syria, and say two armies refused completely to shoot at their own people, and three did the opposite. Why? Because the three armies that shot at people were led by the sons of the rulers. We had a national army. And if somebody says to me, Tantawi was part of Mubarak's regime, I say, I don't give a damn for this. He I know for sure, I know from his mouth that he refused to shoot at the Egyptian people, and Mubarak wanted to get rid of him, and actually... Actually, he got rid of Mubarak. But, he, he ate him on lunch before Mubarak. <laughs> well, ate him on, on but, but surely the point is that it may well be that, that the senior echelons in the military were looking after their own interests, and their own interests are vast in the Egyptian economy, not least. It's a possibility. The question is, why would an Egyptian who risked his life or her life protesting for so long in Tahrir Square, continuing to demand democracy and reform, why should they trust what is, in essence, a junta, military junta? Exactly. A military junta should not be allowed to rule Egypt as what we have seen in South America for decades. But I can only talk to you about what I have seen in Tahrir Square for 18 days. The spirit was totally different. I found everything co uh, opposite of my expectation. I went to, for the first time to Tahrir Square to see a very dirty square. It was very clean. I, my daughters used to go there and, and uh, to, to, to Cairo and talk about harassment. There was no single case of harassment yeah, but in Tahrir Square. With respect, Tarek, you're talking about what happened in February. I'm talking about what happened a few days ago exactly. when, when the military were using the sorts of words about the protest is on the square that Mubarak's people were using just a few short months ago. They were calling them seditious. They were calling them thugs and criminals. They were talking about cleaning out the criminals from Tahrir. It does seem to have flipped in the last few weeks. If the spirit of the 18 days, initial 18 days, does not confront the military junta, we will be down the drain. And I don't think this will happen. I think that the spirit of the new Egypt will even confront the army if the army tries to repeat the banana republics of South America. I think the army takes people very seriously. I know that for sure. They are how, how do you know that? I, I know that from my connections. I talk to people. I, I mean, I, I was talking to Omar Suleiman most of the past 20 years. So I happen. When, when, when you are in the Middle East, the CEO of a major company. I was the a CEO of a, of a major British company for, for 10 years. People take you seriously. People speak to you. Yeah? And, 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 and the, 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 when I say us now, I mean, I mean my oil company. Yeah, well, the, I, 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 I'm interested yeah. that you uh, couch yourself as part of that elite because it, 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 it is the view of many that it's the elites who right now, post-February, are failing to deliver on reform. Let me just read to you uh, the words of, of somebody who... It's respected in the, in the think tank community, Nabil Abdel Fattah from the Al Ahram Center. He says, quote, Great people, mind. Well, great mind, and this is what he says, and it may be relevant to you. People are realizing no reform is going to be initiated by the elites. 
It has to come from the street or it will not come at all. I totally agree. I totally agree to that. Nabil Fattah is a great thinker, a great writer, and I believe if the elite cannot have the sympathy of the street, we will be, we will be in the hands of the Islamists. And that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to say to, to, to the masses that Egypt should be a civil society, should not be under democracy, should not be an Islamic republic. We, are we going to support? We may, we may not. It depends on, on, the, on the homework. If we do the homework, the Christians of Egypt, if the free women of Egypt, if the liberal men of Egypt do their homework, well, we will not end up with four million saying no to the, in the referendum. This, this was very uh, agitating to me. This but, four... but I'm going to stop you because you, you, you speak with the passion of a veteran liberal secular campaigner in Egypt and we're going to get to your thoughts on the Muslim Brotherhood in a moment. But before we get there, just another specific challenge for the military government right now. It's about justice and accountability. In the Hard Talk chair just a short time ago, I had the Secretary General of Amnesty International. He's been talking to the military government. He's been saying to them, look, you must deliver on justice. Justice for the loved ones who lost relatives in, in the killings Absolutely. of January and February, 800 Absolutely. and more of them. Also justice for those who were beaten, who were wounded, who were detained. Hundreds and thousands of them detained uh, for periods and still more. being detained. Can't agree more. Yeah, but the military doesn't appear to be listening. The military is not supposed to do all of this. The military is supposed to look after the transit period and take us to the transformation and leave us with a president, with a new constitution, with a new cabinet and parliament. Yeah, but what do you mean the military is no part of this? The military is still running court. I mean, exactly. emergency law is still being used. Uh, absolutely, but what, what I meant, the military cannot deliver all of these things. They are not trained to do this. They are not qualified to do this. They, are, they, they have been the safeguarding force to the people, but they cannot deliver. They are trained to to fight. They are not trained to write a constitution. They are not trained to run uh, referendums and elections. What we want them to do is to, to do what they said. We will be in less than one year from the revolution, 25th of January, we'll have a, a new constitution, a new parliament, a new prime minister, and a new president. And we, we, we are trying to, to go that way, but we, we disagree in Egypt on this order. Some people would like, like myself, to have a constitution first. We need to know the rule of the game before we start the game. But some people say, and the Islamists in particular, no. We have to have the elections, and the people who would be elected are the ones who would work out the, well, the yeah, constitution. Well, you've, you've there isolated one of the key debates and disputes right now in Egypt, which may well uh, color so much of what happens in the next few months. Are you telling me that you still oppose the notion of having parliamentary elections by the end of September? Absolutely. I, and yet you call yourself a Democrat. I absolutely, I say that even in our history we had only one democratic era from 1924 to 1952. The constitution was worked out in 1923. At the end of the year we had the elections and then we had the first elected government in 1924. This seems to me to be the rational way to go that we know the, ru the rule of the game but, before we start the game. Yes, but you did say to me just a moment ago, you expressed wholehearted support for the notion that the street must drive the nature of Egypt's reforms. And the street, it seems, according to opinion polls, is speaking loud and clear. 76% of Egyptians support the idea of having parliamentary elections by the end of September. No, they were asked to give their opinion on four articles that they have nothing to do with that. They were asked, do you agree or you dis disagree to these four articles? But it, it, they didn't say patently clear, we want to have the parliament before the constitution. And we are now saying the following, if they choose this, we will abide by the rule. But we are trying not to go that way. So with and your contacts, the ones you talk about so proudly, you're saying to your people, who you know well in the military, that they should still uh, stop the plan, abandon the idea of early parliamentary elections, and go about writing a constitution first. This is what I'm trying hard with many people to do, especially the minorities. Isn't it difficult, though, for people like you, who've been talking reform in Egypt for an awful long time, and I'm thinking also of people like Mohammed al Baradai to now, after everything that's happened since February, be telling the Egyptian people and the world that the one thing you don't want is elections. No, we, we absolutely want elections, but we want to know the premises on which we stand. And you, 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 don't, you don't have a written constitution here, but you have, you have constitutionally customary rules. And these rules were formulated way before your elections. What I'm saying is, we try to say to people, we need a constitution that will not lay, take us to autocracy and theocracy. Because we see this, we try to say this democratically. If we, if we succeed, fine. If we fail, 
also fine, but we have the full right to say to people, you might repeat the Hamas experience in Gaza. Yeah, well, and we are trying to alarm them not to do that. You are trying to alarm them, that's for sure. I mean, why do you say that if the Muslim Brotherhood, who of course uh, have now formed their own party and will be fighting in the elections whenever they come, why do you say that if they do very well, and they're only going to fight half the seats, they say, but if they do very well, why would that be pushing Egypt toward autocracy? Because personally, I don't believe there are moderate Muslim Islamists and otherwise. They are, there, there is no single moderate Islamist on earth. There are moderate Muslims. But once you are Islamist, it means that you want to run life, run the society. Your terms of reference are religious. So I don't believe that there is one single person that deserves correctly, objectively, to be described as uh, moderate Islamists. There but the are. truth is you don't know what the Muslim Brotherhood would do were they to hold parliamentary power because, we, we well, think? they haven't said. I mean, we had a Sam Malerian, one of the so-called moderate voices of the Brotherhood on the program recently. I pushed him on various policy decisions. For example, would alcohol be illegal in Egypt? I, I watched that. Yes, and, and he Very wouldn't good. tell me. I mean, Absolutely. Quite serious, uh, okay, this is, this is the core of the matter. I was speaking at a number of think tanks here, including the House of Commons a few days ago, and I said, I don't want to keep saying to them, are you democratic or not? Do you believe in, uh, in women's rights or not? I want to go to issues like this. We want to discuss things like others, plurality, Christians, Jews, women, tourism, yeah, many things. Education, for instance, I asked one of the leaders of Muslim Brothers the following question. I am very much involved in many councils of education, including the Supreme Council of Education in the Emirates. And I know that the best system in the world is not in a great country, in, in a large country, it's in Finland. A very small country considered to have the best education system. When you say to the Muslim Brothers, what do you think of this? You know what, what Abu Futuh, the leader of the Muslim Brothers, said here in Chatham House a few days ago? He said that, to the person who said to him, what do you think of an education system like this, based on innovation and critical mind? The answer was, you're trying to sell to me a colonial and imperial agenda.